Right, so I am very lucky because this morning someone gave a very, very nice introduction to some of the methodologies which I'm going to talk about now, uh, particularly uh, quantitative structure activity relationship analysis, so uh, that would make my life a lot, uh, a lot easier. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, an approach we have taken to um, try to make sense uh, of very large data sets in the context of understanding uh, drug toxicity, and then in particular uh, applying that to understanding non theorem mechanism of action. So where I come from is, um, is really the, I think you can call it the omics revolution, which some people love it very much and some other people don't. Uh, but really I think what we can say is that uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we came out with technology that allowed us to measure the uh, expression of proteins and genes uh, in, uh, in systems, in biological systems, on a genome scale. And that, of course, was very exciting. Oops, <laughs> revealed my trick. Uh, that was quite very exciting because it really gave us the possibility to understand complex systems at a level that really was unprecedented. But uh, at the same time, it really posed a very big challenge. And the way I always saw that challenge is that uh, it's really how to avoid stamp collecting because it's very easy to get a lot of data, but very hard, at least in my experience, to make sense of it, to really understand what is important. So um, in understanding what is important, I think the key is, uh, is this sentence here, is the integrate the multi-layer global measurements into a high-level interpretative model, which is easy to say, but difficult to do. But as everything that is difficult to do, we have to simplify the problem. And when you deal with a lot of variables, you have to use uh, simple approaches, models that have very, very few parameters. So most of the uh, task of taking measurements, for example, across exposures, that could be proteomics, transcriptomics and the more the better, including phenotypic measurements, really are just a, a lot of variables that you have to try to identify their relationship with and their relationship with phenotype. Most of the methods that really infer the structure of a network from measurements are really based on the concept of gene-to-gene -gene correlation, which is rather simple. So you try to establish basically what is the probability that one gene or one problem or protein is in a given state by the knowledge of another gene. And, uh, and that's, uh, um, I cite here, mutual information, which is uh, an information theoretical measure of gene-to-gene -gene correlation, simply because it's probably, in my field, uh, the most used uh, uh, system. So my talk is going to be structured in two uh, small parts. Uh, the first one is really an example of a system ecotoxicology approach uh, to link compound physical chemical features with organism molecular response and toxicity. I'm mean, a warning here, there's no nanoparticles at all, but I think the approach is very applicable uh, and you'll see what our plans are. And the second part is a case study to understand the mechanism of action of civil nanowires, which has been a rather new thing for me and I hope uh, is interesting and promising. So, we work basically in an organism called Daphne Magna, which is uh, in our hands, uh, effectively, a convenient biosensor. Now, Daphnia is actually pretty useful because it has a wide geographic distribution. It's pretty important in the freshwater food webs, so it's actually environmentally relevant. And uh, it does adapt very rapidly to range of habitats. So, basically, it's a fantastic little organism. Um, by the way, Daphnia fulex genome is fully sequenced. And Daphnia magna, which is the species we like to use in Europe for uh, safety assessment, uh, actually is almost sequenced. So, all this work comes from a collaboration with Chris Woolpe, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a very good friend of mine and collaborator, and he's the one that did all the experiments, which is rather convenient in this particular case. So he tested at the beginning 36 chemicals belonging to a very broad range of classes, measured the LC50, and did uh, acute exposures of 48 hours uh, and uh, obtain microarray data. Very much the same type of arrays that we have seen in the presentation before. In fact, I think you use Agilent, which is exactly what we have used here. So the question really here was whether we could construct uh, a model, so to speak, uh, that could really explain uh, what happens in the um, um, conceptual um, process that gives uh, a chemical entering in the system, in this case as an organism, hit a target, uh, more than one target of course, uh, eventually eliciting a molecular response, uh, leading somehow to toxicity. That's a really very high level view. So the way we approach this uh, is twofold. First of all, 
we use uh, regression models that uh, employ a genetic algorithm procedure for identifying the relevant physical chemical features that can actually help us predict the molecular response. A molecular response in this beast uh, is not a simple thing. It's 35,000 genes, uh, if you ignore all splicing variants and all other bits and pieces. So it's complex to do, and so we don't do it at the gene level. That's the answer. We take uh, uh, pathways defined by experts, for example, KEG or other systems, and we use the descriptor of pathway activities, such as, for example, independent components or principal components, to simplify the structure of the system, leading from 35,000 genes to something like 200 pathways, indexes. These models here predict uh, from the basis of the physical chemical feature the molecular response at the pathway level. Then, uh, this molecular response is tested for its ability to predict uh, toxicity outcome. It's what you could call a two-step uh, quiz model. We proved some time ago that these particular models tend to be more effective in predicting toxicity, simply in terms of accuracy of prediction in this case, than conventional methods. They have the added advantage that give you a hint of a mechanism, if you really like the idea. So, uh, to make the story short, uh, um, obviously, not every single pathway you test is linked to physical chemical features and predictive of outcome, but this cartoon here represents a summary of what we did find in Daphne Magna in the context of the chemical space we do have. And to make the story short, uh, we find that pathways involving signaling and membranes is really very much to do with uh, physical chemical features. We can predict uh, their activity on the basis of the physical chemical features, but themselves, they don't seem to be predictive at all of the toxicity. But they are linked, uh, because of all the arrows, mechanistically to terminal pathways, mainly in metabolism and drug metabolism, that really are very good predictors of uh, uh, um, toxicity outcome. Now, so far, so good. It looks like we can sort of provide at least a nice cartoon that explains our data and help us providing some interesting hypotheses. But that's not about it. So, here, pathway level, like zooming from the very top of our airplane looking at uh, a city below. Here, is zooming in and beginning to look at individual genes that really matter and uh, physical chemical feature, color-coded in blue and in green. LD50, which is important, uh, the toxicity, so it's an endpoint, it's a phenotypic endpoint, uh, is there and it's labeled in red. To make the story short, uh, a network like that is good because it can be studied. And normally we use a topological sort of approaches for studying the structure of a network and understanding what's important. Here, we didn't need to do that very much because basically we simply had to ask the question what is closest to, to, to LC50 in terms of genes and, uh, and, uh, and the physiochemical features, and we find two interesting things. The first one is that uh, A log PS, uh, uh, log KOW, calculated with the A log PS, is really the closest physiochemical features. And when we look at what the genes which are closer to LC50 really do, um, uh, sorry, close to um, A log PS really do, we found out that uh, for uh, chemicals which has uh, an A log, a, a log KOW less than two, Effectively, you have uh, one type of response, which tends to be green, meaning that in this particular case, genes are downregulated. Now, every gene is downregulated, just these genes here. But as soon as you reach that particular threshold, everything switch. So basically, we discover that uh, the log KOW is somehow representing a transcriptional switch that actually, believe it or not, represents in this case 70% of the transcriptional behavior we observe in the system. So we got quite excited, and uh, to make the story short, uh, we started behaving like biologists. So we look at the genes that behave like that and see what they do, okay? And what we found out is that uh, it was screaming to us, calcium signaling, the way you do that, you put all these gene lists in, in, a, in a pathway analysis tool, such as the one we have seen in the previous presentation, and you come up with this answer, the cell calcium signaling. And so you say, okay, could it be, therefore, that uh, the particular transcriptional switch and toxicity response that we do have predicted with our model is something to do with release of calcium from the intracellular storages? And we tested that hypothesis by using a specific inhibitor, tapsigargine, or the calcium ATPase pump, uh, inducing massive release of calcium and demonstrating that there was a statistical association between uh, genes linked by our model to KOW and genes which are actually regulated by tapsigargine. And it's not a weak statistical link. It's 36% of that response uh, is uh, explained by calcium release. So it's not that bad for a market-rare experiment. 
So, um, this is uh, fundamentally uh, one example of what we do in our group, uh, and it's really trying to sort of uh, um, do more than just analyzing macro data or proteomics data and provide interesting hypotheses, but embedding that very much uh, into quantitative structure activity relationship analysis approaches. So, as I said, it's a bit you know, sort of disappointing. I'm not talking about nanomaterials yet, but uh, in order to test uh, the validity of this approach uh, in nanomaterials, there is a very small, a few slide long uh, case study I would like to tell you about, again done in collaboration with Chris Wolpe. So here are silver nanowires that use two different uh, coatings, organic uh, polyvinyl polyolidon and uh, inorganic amorphous aluminum doped silica. Apologies for my accent, I'm Italian. And, uh, and uh, there are two different types, of, uh, of course, because there's long and short uh, silver nanowires. So this is what we work with. So uh, Chris and I has a paper in submission at the moment uh, of this very uh, analysis done using um, microarray data. This study was done using deep sequencing, which is a different way of acquiring RNA expression data. We used uh, actually a very, very in-depth sequencing. So we believe this approach is more sensitive to the one we use in the other paper, hopefully making another interesting paper. So first thing we discover is this. It's something very simple. Get the data, get rid of all the noise, and use principal component analysis to see what happens. And what we found out is that here you have control, you have very uh, little response for um, silver on its own in aqueous phase, you have uh, reasonably little response for the short and long nanowires uh, with the silica, and uh, we have massive response when we have PVP. Interestingly, the principal component analysis decoupled on the first component uh, the response of the short nanowire, whereas on the uh, the second component, uh, basically, it shows the response of the long nanowire with the same coating, which is rather interesting because it sort of naturally provides an evidence that we have orthogonal responses dependent, probably, hypothesis, on the length of the nanowire. Fair enough. So we did a little comparison among other things, so showing, for example, what was the difference between long uh, nanowire with PVP and long nanowire in silica, and focus on this signature here, which with a little bit uh, of uh, um, uh, optimism, you could define as a PVP specific. It's not, it cannot be demonstrated with this experiment, but it's a hypothesis. And one probably more slide to go to the point. So, if you take that uh, and you do the functional analysis, which we have seen obviously many times now, you find three terms, spliceosome, ribosome, and butanoid meta metabolism. A rather difficult to sort of make sense of. So, there's a little uh, thing here that shows how we have gone a little bit farther on. So, we took the model we made before, the graphical model linking uh, toxicity and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, gene expression, and look at the neighborhood of LD15 here. We decomposed this network in different modules on the basis of community detection algorithms. So these are different independent modules, and find out that all the toxicity was linked in that sub-modules. And then finally, basically checked what was functionally in there, and we discovered that we had statistically significant association with LEK's activity, including, for example, chromosome maintenance, uh, protein transport, RNA processing, and protein catabolism. And basically showing that by doing the particular approach, we could be a bit more sensitive in terms of the particular functions we find. But all that remains, of course, a hypothesis and a work in progress. What we want to do, obviously, is at some stage uh, to get the right data for applying the Quasar approach to nanomaterials, which I think we can now do in the context of a project I'm involved, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, use a broader range of species where mechanistic studies are possible. Rather hard to do them in Daphne. I think I finished here. Thank you, Francesco. This is very nice, and uh, you have time for at least two questions. I might not need. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have been listening to all the presentations this morning, and it has been very fascinating in here. And you can see the common thread between all the quantitative methods from what Hugh has demonstrated in relation to particle number and in vitro system to what we have seen with the QSAR method, trying to relate the particle 
physical chemical characteristics with the uh, endpoint. And then we take the story of Christopher about the complication when the particle not only ingests particle, but they decide to split and therefore divide the loads and so on, which is another dimension on how the particle dose in particles uh, in, 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 in cells are like. And now we have you talking about your Daphna model, not only as an ecotoxicology problem, but as, as, a, as a marker, as, as, as a nice biological model for assessing particle uptakes and, and, and responses and so on. Uh, my, my, my question in here is in a way to keep the thread of this entire uh, session going. Uh, maybe we have some moment in here to, for, for you to say more about the linkage back on uh, system toxicology that your colleague has uh, discussed early on, which uh, you say that you'd, uh, you skip off a few <laughs> slides. So maybe here's the moment to say, how do you link what Hugh and Christopher and, uh, and, 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 and Thomas has done with, uh, with currently the set of uh, data that you have? Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, there's many answers to that question. I have my own answer, which uh, um, is uh, very personal. These uh, particular approaches here, they sit at the very top uh, when you start to look at the system. So the, one of the problems with the kind of things we do is that we have really to admit that we do not understand very much uh, what are the mechanisms of toxicity simply because uh, these are very new materials, for example. But even in standard organic chemistry, it's a rather hard problem to solve. So what we try to do here is to understand what are the important components. So how does it fit uh, with mechanistic modeling, which is what many people uh, like to refer more properly to systems biology? It's uh, basically by providing a way to identifying the important uh, system that uh, needs to be modeled at the mechanistic level. For example, using dynamical models and things like that. I, th I think that's really nicely sum up, but we are not finished yet. Uh, we have another uh, approach here, but give a hand applause, Francesco. Thank you. So. Uh